It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Today's show, we're continuing our Today in Manufacturing series in partnership with the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. This series is brought to you by HLB Gross Collins, a top 25 Atlanta CPA firm specializing in manufacturing, logistics, and supply chain operations. Hey, stay tuned as we work hard to increase your manufacturing leadership IQ. A uh, quick programming note, uh, you don't want to miss conversations like this, so find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. All right, with no further ado, I want to welcome in our guests, our hosts, special co-hosts, and our guests here today on Supply Chain Now. Leading off, Jason Moss, CEO of the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. Jason, good morning. Good morning, Scott, man. Glad to be here. Hope you are well. Looking forward to these great conversations, and I think we've got another great one teed up here today. Now, Jason, we couldn't do it without the one and only Laura Matajewski, principal and leader of the manufacturing distribution and supply chain practice at HLB Gross Collins. Laura, how you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks so much for uh, having us this morning. And I can't wait to dive into our conversation today um, uh, with Jeff and Hank. Agreed. And you're, you're letting the cat out of the bag. We've got to go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm too excited. Sorry. Uh, no, there's worse things to do. But we've got to we do have a great story teed up today, uh, a story based here in Georgia. And, and uh, um, I think something that we're all going to learn a lot about leadership, about manufacturing, and about successful business growth. So on that note, let's welcome in Hank Pickin, chairman of Beaumont Products. Hank, good morning. Morning. Great to see you. And you're joined by Jeff Pickin, CEO at Beaumont Products. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Scott. Thank you for having us. You bet. All right. So we got a great conversation teed up. There's a lot to tackle uh, in and of itself as it relates to Beaumont Products. But for starters, let's get to know both of y'all a little bit better. So Hank, let's start with you. Where did you grow up? And give us an anecdote or two about your upbringing. Uh, uh, dirty, dirty little secret. I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. Really? Uh, born, born, and, born and raised about uh, 20 miles away from the Empire State Building. So my uh, youth was, was spent uh, in and around New York City. Um, I was born back in the Eisenhower uh, era, grew up in the Eisenhower era. And uh, that was a very different environment to grow up in. And of course, as I progressed through uh, 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 high school and on into college, we were as a generation faced with a terrible thing called the draft. Mm. And uh, in, in, in my day, one went to college, one stayed in college or one got drafted. So there wasn't any of this stuff about um, um, taking a year off and wandering through the, uh, the, the mountains in Europe to find <laughs> oneself. One stayed in school to avoid uh, Uncle Sam. Um, and part of that was uh, during my college days, um, uh, my school offered an ROTC program. And uh, given the alternative of risking the draft at a point in time or uh, going in as an officer, I upped to... Um, uh, sign up for the ROTC program, and um, and ended up um, being commissioned upon graduation from college, and then uh, went on to graduate school, got a master's degree in uh, business administration, and um, during that time, my time and grade in the military accrued, so I went in the service uh, called into active duty. Um, September of uh, 65, right after uh, graduation from um, business school, and um, <clears throat> ended up uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia, at uh, the infantry school, and then Fort Riley, Kansas, and watched the uh, 1st Infantry Division uh, head off to uh, Vietnam. I stayed in um, Fort Riley for a period of time, and then I ended up 
going over to Vietnam in the 9th uh, Infantry Division and served for nine months in basically 66 and 67. So uh, defining, defining moment of my, uh, my career, um, the, good, the good news is I spent the two years in graduate school before going in the service. And um, that, that certainly helped um, my, my MOS and my training. Although I was an infantry officer, um, I was a able to um, use some of my managerial skills and leadership skills that I had learned in business school. Hank, um, I appreciate you sharing all of that. Uh, a lot of folks, um, you know, it's helpful to put that perspective on because a lot of folks haven't, haven't had to endure that, right? And be thrust into a really uh, tough conflict, tough time. When you think about the folks you serve with, one follow-up question before we get over to Jeff. If you can point to one that really impacted how you and shaped your worldview, shaped your view about leadership or, or you know, how to lead your life, what, what was one really big in, in lesson learned from your time in Vietnam? Well, I would, I would say um, a couple of, couple of individuals, but first on the list would be the commanding general of the 9th Infantry Division. His name was George S. Eckhart. And um, Eckhart um, made all of his um, staff um, wear a, a little pin, uh, initials, and I can't remember the exact the initials, but the phrase itself that was uh, uh, um, memorialized in that pin was, your troops do best what you inspect most. Mm. And I, I think, um, there is a tremendous meaning behind that, not just in, in the military, but in, in, in managing and, and leading a business. And I think um, that has led me in, in, in many ways to, to make sure that um, things that we, we look at on a regular basis are in shape. Um, I think the term in, in, in business is very much management by walking around. And uh, one, of, one of the joys of, of managing and leading uh, Beaumont products is the plant is right here. <laughs> you don't have to go through layers and layers and conversation and buffers to have a communication with the plant. If you want to know what's going on, you get up from your desk and walk, it, walk next door and, and wander through the plant. And I think the same thing is, is true in you know, managing a sales department and uh, actually getting out in the field and, and working with customers and working with salespeople. And I, I do think the focus on um, your, your troops do best what you inspect most and it, it, it inspect as, as a different meaning in the military, obviously, but certainly uh, checking and, and confirming, I guess, trust but verify. I love term. it. I've already placed an order for a thousand pins. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that from you blatantly, but uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure they're pretty rusty by now. That was uh, 50, 55 years ago. But, uh. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing and, and really appreciate your service and your combat service and, and great to have you here with us today. Okay. I want to switch over to Jeff Picken. Jeff, good morning. You know, same questions that, you know, fascinating story. We love one of my favorite parts of this, uh, Jason Lar is hearing kind of the story behind the story, right? What leads to the success y'all been experiencing that Beaumont products, especially about the people and the leaders. So Jeff, give us a little background. Where, where are you from? And, and give us an anecdote or two about your, your journey. Yeah. So also uh, guilty of being born in New York, um, did, uh, schooling in New York, uh, up until high school with a short stint in, uh, Italy. We, uh, Hank was working for Colgate Palmolive and we got stationed over in Rome, Italy. So I got to do three years of schooling in the American Overseas School of Rome, which was a, obviously a huge impact on an on a, on a eight, eight-year-old guy um, being over there, coming back. And then uh, another startling moment was going from uh, schooling in New York to uh, starting high school in Georgia at, uh, at North Cobb. And uh, that was a bit of a culture shift. I had, I had no idea what a Leonard Skinner or a Dale Earnhardt was, so I had to, to learn real fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I learned to love it and I would never go back. Um, and then after two years at North Cobb, they opened up a new high school in Cobb County called Harrison, Carl Harrison High School, and uh, decided to move over there as the first class. So I was actually the first person ever accepted to college from Carl Harrison High School uh, and I went, ended up going to Georgia Tech. Uh, did Georgia Tech and while at Tech, did the co-op program and co-opt um, with a company called m, m Mars. 
out in Waco, Texas, and I got to do industrial engineering out there, helping out making uh, Skittles and Starburst. So it's a, a quick recap of my formative years. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to throw Jason and Laura a curveball because Hank and Jeff have shared a lot already. What, what's your favorite key takeaway before we dive into a little deeper in their professional journey? And uh, Laura, let's start with you. Let's see. Well, you know, I, I do have a, a slight chance of knowing Jeff and Hank beforehand. So I have to say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a little proud of those Northern roots as well as uh, our, our Southern points here. But, you know, um, I think overall, it was great to hear um, both of them share about their experiences. And I have to say that one of my favorite candies is, is the ones that uh, Jeff mentioned that he was involved in the process of making. So I'll be giving those out for Halloween this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Laura. All right, Jason, what about you? Well, I think people would be very surprised to find out that I also am from New York. Well, well maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe would not. shock I our audience. Off. I don't know that I could pull it off. But I tell you, uh, Hank, I really appreciate you sharing, you know, your experience there in, in the military. Scott and I are both veterans, and, and, and I'm, I, I, too, am taking that away. But I think I'm going to make a T-shirt out of it, that, that your troops do best what you inspect the most. So you can count on that. That's really good stuff, and it helps us really redefine and refocus what we as leaders need to be doing in our community and, 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 um, and what our people need to expect from us. I think that's another piece of it. Um, but I, I do want to pitch a question over to you, Hank. Um, what would you say was one of your – uh, eureka moments what is something that really just stands out for you in business and in leadership what's some of the things we need to that, what else can we be taking away from this uh, um i i i think um the the big eureka uh, moment of my career um uh, goes back to um getting out of the service when i I, I graduated, as I mentioned before, with a, with a master's degree in business administration. And to make matters even worse, it was from an Ivy League school that was the Amos Tuck School, Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire. So I'm, I'm a double whammy Yankee. Um, so <laughs> but uh, I had majored in marketing and uh, had every intention of becoming a product manager and uh, working my way up the, the, the route to management through um, marketing channels. And uh, in those days, after I got out of the service, went through the interviewing process and talked to uh, the big soapers and the big food companies. In those days, uh, General Foods, as an example, was a standalone uh, company. And uh, I came very close to going to work for um, General Foods, uh, went through a series of interviews, and all of a sudden, the eureka moment was I couldn't find anybody in a marketing position at General Foods over the age of 40. And I, th I thought to myself, you know, what do older uh, product managers do the rest of their lives? And um, as a re result, I said, I'm gonna take a little bit longer look at this and um, decided to go to work in a public accounting firm, went to work for Price Waterhouse and worked for them for, um, two and a half, almost, almost three years, long enough to um, go to night school and get the required classes and courses for my CPA exam, sat for my exam and basically uh, got my uh, notification from the state of New York that I passed the exam, walked into my boss's office, resigned, and um, started my career in, um, in product management at uh, hey, Lieber Brothers. And, hey, if uh, I can interject just for a second. Um, uh, I'm always curious about when folks spend time early in their career at a, at a, a great firm like a PwC, did it expose you to a variety of industries and sectors and, and business models that, that helped you later in your career? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the other little piece of that story, and I, I'll, I'll finish it and then come back because I think it'll help address that, is in my infinite wisdom, I said, okay, now I've got my CPA. I'll just go and find myself a marketing job. And because I have that financial background, um, I will be on a fast track to management. Hmm. And it was incredible um, the, the number of companies that turned me down for uh, interviewing for a product management position because by definition, an accountant was not creative enough to be a product wow. manager. Interesting. And, wow. and ran into that on several different occasions. And then of course, um, 
as, as truth be known, uh, arrived on scene as a, a, a lowly assistant product manager and was given heaps of paperwork and analytical stuff to do. And here's your brand P and L and all that stuff. And we're, we're guys uh, sitting, sitting around um, struggling with the numbers. Um, I was able to blow through them in, in a matter of, rather matter of minutes. So um, mm -hmm. it, it stood me very well at the time. But in, in, in answer to your question, I think the, the beauty of working for a, um, a, a public accounting firm early is exactly that, is exposure to all kinds of businesses. And one of, one of the eureka moments of, of that is you realize um, every, every corporation has some sort of a financial toy that um, they are able to play with. And these huge um, Fortune 500 companies that I was inside of looking at, you realize what the toy was and a decision could be made at the end of a quarter that could influence uh, earnings per share a couple cents one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, since, since General Foods is, is not in business any longer, I, I, I think I can, Tell, tell the story that one of the games they played was when does the sugar truck or sugar barge uh, come on board into the U.S. from um, the Caribbean based on uh, import tariffs and the amount of sugar that was being imported for the likes of Jell-O and, and uh, Tang and all the other um, products that would use so much sugar. Um, just determining when that ship was going to come into port or not come into port could influence earnings per share about a penny wow. or so. Interesting. Very interesting. It all goes back to sugar. It yeah. all goes back to sugar. <laughs> the world runs. Yeah, well, no doubt. Hank, no. I appreciate you shedding. I, I want to circle back uh, on the Eureka question. Uh, Hank, I know there, there's a lot more we could dive into your journey, but let's bring Jeff in here. So Jeff, you, you alluded to some of your, your um, career journey earlier as we were getting to know you a little better and getting to know you, how you had to adapt a new citizenship as you moved from New York to Georgia. Leonard Skinner and Dale Earnhardt, love that line, Jeff. What, um, tell us a little bit more about your, your, what you learned early in your career and some of the roles you had. I think uh, as far as Eureka moments, I was really fortunate to have one even before starting on a career. I was uh, in, in the summer times in high school, I would actually work in the plant here at Beaumont, filling bottles and working with uh, with uh, our, our men and women who are producing product every day. Really had a good time um, with them. And then later on, I actually went back to New York for a family, uh, family get together, probably around Thanksgiving, and was talking to one of my older cousins. We were walking across our town of Bronxville, which is about a mile, mile wide. So we were walking from one parent's house to the other. And he was at UMass studying mechanical engineering. And I was uh, you know, in high school not knowing what I wanted to do. And I was explaining to him, how I liked working in the plant and how I would <clears throat> look at what we were doing and figure out ways to, to make the machines run better or to be able to do this with less people or do that. And he goes, that's industrial engineering. That's what you need to do. And I said, hey, wow, that's great. And uh, I knew right away while still in high school before even applying to Georgia Tech that I wanted to be an industrial engineer, which I think you know, if all of us could spend time and find just one young person and help them uh, understand, you know, when you're in high school, you don't know what all these um, professional professions are. And if you could just find one person, help them find out what their passion is and tell them what that is as far as a profession, I think it would be a huge help to all young people out there to find out what they like before they go off. Well said, Jeff. Uh, I, I can tell you just from my experience, I never set foot in a manufacturing plant until after college. Um, and that opened up my eyes. You know, my granddad retired from Kimberly Clark as a machine operator in his second career. And it's a shame that I didn't get a chance to sit down and, and talk manufacturing with granddad. And that's such a missed opportunity. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Jeff. Uh, Jason and Laura, before we, we dive fuller into Beaumont, uh, Beaumont products, I'm sure what Jeff and Hank have shared resonates with you. Jason, key takeaway? Yeah, yeah, I tell you, um, you know, talking about Eureka moments, when I was in the first grade at McDonough Elementary School, they took a group of us to the Ford factory in Hapeville, and I walked through that factory, and they were rolling in steel and rolling out cars, and I was fascinated, and that fascination has never ended. I mean, I love being, being able to hang around really smart people that are coming up with amazing solutions to tough problems that in a million years I would have never figured out. 
right? I mean, I just love the industry and see people able to make things. I mean, those are some of the, the pieces. That's the thing I'm so excited about in the manufacturing space and encouraging more people to come hang out with us, come get involved, come at least learn about what it takes to make things. Because, you know, I mean, if, if you don't mine it and you don't grow it, the only other way to generate wealth is to manufacture it, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's manufacturing, farming, and 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 uh, mining are only th only three areas on the planet that actually create new money, create things. So so I think that that all of us pulling together, and that's one of the things I love most about supply chain now radio is is making sure that we we tell the story and we get people engaged that otherwise might not understand the impact of manufacturing in our economy. So you know, again, hats off to you guys, what you guys do every day, and and I think we just need to keep banging that drum. Well put, well put, bang it like who's the drummer in the Beatles? <laughs> uh, can't remember his name right off, but yeah, bang it. Hey, uh, Jeff, we're going to keep playing on your music thing. You started once you laid out Leonard Skinner, we have to bake a lot more of that in today's show. Um, all right. So Laura, give us your key takeaway from what Hank and Jeff have been sharing about your Eureka moments. And then let's move right into learning a lot more about Be uh, Beaumont products. Absolutely. Well, I think what I picked up from, uh, from their conversations, what they just shared was, um, first of all, I, you know, it's near and dear to my heart for what Hank had to share from the public accounting side, but, um, you know, and that exposure from that side, but I, I see where people continue to be successful in their careers, regardless of whether they stay in what I'm doing and what Hank has gone on to, to grow and develop, um, is that you've got to focus on, uh, you know, understanding all the aspects of it. You know, you want to understand the financial piece to understand how to make that piece and then how to make it to be successful. So I think those components together is huge. And the, the people that get that uh, from, from those different avenues, they understand the hands-on and then the other components that are gonna make it happen, that, that puzzle piece together there is, is big. And then touching on what Jeff had to say about um, getting to understand what it was that he was really, how to define what it was that was, he was passionate about, what he wanted to go after in school. Um, I, you know, I think that's phenomenal because there's so many um, young people, this next generation that are out there and we continue to try to get them aware of the uh, awesome opportunities in manufacturing, the things they can do out there, the ideas, all of that stuff that, that just pings with them that we are kind of, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to call us like old set in our ways, but you know, we're at that point now where we're, we're continuing to absorb at our level, but what they have to bring to the table, I mean, just bar none, it's fantastic. And it really kind of blows you out of the water on what they can do to bring innovation and ideas to continue to grow the business. You want things to continue to succeed. You want to see that, that path down the, the line there. So I think what they both had to share was, was really just touching home there on those points. Well put. So now we get the chance to dive into the story that is Beaumont products. So Laura, take it away. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I'd like to kick this off with you, Hank. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Beaumont products, just how it was created, what the company does there? Um, and then um, uh, I'd love to also then kick over as well to Jeff to add any insights and share what your roles are. What is it you're doing day to day um, to continue to bring the Beaumont product name out to your customers? Yeah, you know, working backwards, I think you probably get a different answer from me than you will from Jeff on the last <laughs> point, but we'll, we'll, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, I had come down to uh, Atlanta in the late, uh, late 80s uh, to take uh, take over an ill-fated uh, leveraged buyout, and uh, that that company was in the specialty chemical business here in uh, in Marietta, and um, it became painfully obvious that that was not going to be a good long-term uh, career move for me because, as I mentioned, it was an ill-fated um, leverage buyout, and anyone who has not had that kind of experience realizes that when you wake up one day and reporting to a bank, as opposed to being reporting to a, uh, uh, a, a normal board of directors, um, it's an unusual business situation where you do not get on the same page at all as to what is, what's required to turn the business around. So um, it became painfully obvious that I was going to uh, leave. And um, in doing so, I did what I, I had called in my career creative shopping. 
and I was going around to different retailers and looking at products on the shelves to see if there was something there that local manufacturer or whatever that uh, might be interested in uh, a, a marketing guy. And uh, ended up picking up this product on the shelf in a, a hardware store, a true value store here in Kennesaw called Citrus Magic. And uh, looked at the bottle and I turned it over and it said, manufactured in Peachtree City, Georgia, um, PRH company. And um, went, went through a series of uh, phone calls and got this guy on the phone, his name was Paul R. Hurtenson, and PRH, and uh, I talked to Paul and he said, funniest thing, just last night I was talking to my wife about selling the business. Mm. Um, <clears throat> who, know, who knows how truthful that was, but <laughs> that, that began a, 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 a dialogue that sort of took place over a three or four month period of time. And we ended up uh, acquiring the business in uh, May of 91, which was sneaking up on our 30th anniversary. Um, and it, 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 there was some uniqueness in there and a good marriage to my personal background, being consumer pa packaged goods, and that being a, a consumer packaged good, and plus the fact coming out of the specialty chemical business, I had some idea of uh, the packaging and the chemistry involved, although I'm not a, not a chemist. But I thought it would be interesting. I don't know whether you, you guys have ever, ever seen this or not, but um, the container itself um, is a non-aerosol container. And 30 years ago, um, aerosols were a dirty word. And, um, I, and I think in many, many ways still are. So we were able to um, marry um, a concept that was uh, tight in the consumer products business, but also very timely from a natural presentation. Not only were the ingredients 100% natural, but the package and the delivery was a non-aerosol system. And what it is, is it, this is a standard um, aerosol can, and this is what we call a bag on valve. And what we do is we fill this can twice. This, this uh, is a Mylar bag that's fused the stem of the uh, aerosol valve, and it's placed inside this container. It goes into the first station and compressed air, ambient air, not gas or anything of the sort, but ambient air is forced into the can. Then this cap comes down and is crimped. And we actually inject um, the fluid through the dip tube. And what happens is that bag that's uh, attached to the valve inflates, increasing the ambient pressure inside the can. So that when you push the button down, you're not releasing any gas into the atmosphere but the pressure inside the can is squeezing the bag and the juice is coming out. So what's coming out is 100% pure citrus oil. And that is uh, an absolute, not only does it smell great, but it destroys odors on contact. So that's, that's the magic of the citrus magic. So uh, around that basic product, um, which was in, acquired in, um, in 91, uh, we have built um, what is now Beaumont Products. Um, I think uh, we're tripping, tripping down memory lane uh, not too long ago. We were in business for about four or five years before we were, we were clicking in at about a, uh, a, a decent million dollar annual rate. And uh, so we, at that, in those days, um, had five employees and uh, we are now um, in four buildings here in, in Kennesaw, um, 125 employees, and um, do, doing on a, a monthly basis what we used to do on an annual basis in sales. So it's been, uh, it's been a fun ride. Um, the, the other part of the equation that I would uh, put together, and I, I know you'll talk to Jeff in, in a minute, is obviously um, when I started this company, I felt very very comfortable in the two key areas, and that is um, sales marketing as well as finance and accounting. But I had never run a manufacturing facility um, until I came um, to Atlanta. So uh, this was all new news to me, and Jeff in his early days and college days 
expressed some interest in getting involved in, uh, in Beaumont long term. And that was the, the one piece of the equation that was badly missing. And of course, the other piece um, that has come back and, and helped uh, tremendously in Beaumont's gro growth is not only uh, just knowledge of um, manufacturing, but you do not go to tech without being an, an, an IT uh, wizard. <laughs> Uh, and I, and I got to tell you that I've, I'm totally gapped from an um, IT standpoint. I learned to program in Fortran with uh, compilers and, and um, uh, punch cards and the like. But all, all of that is uh, what Jeff brought to the party. And I think so much of that, um, particularly the IT experience and knowledge, uh, has, has really propelled our growth into what is the, the professional um, a retailer today. The, the, the beginnings of our business was selling to Ma and Pa, and we were selling uh, case, cases, almost piece goods, uh, onesies and twosies to a small drugstore or small hardware store or the like. And, uh, you know, today we're, we're shipping truckloads and pallets. You know, that's the big, the big change as time goes by. Love that. And of course, you can't make that conversion without those gaps or filling those gaps you, you exactly. identified, Hank. Mm -hmm. And gosh, how fortunate to fill in those gaps with a sharp industrial engineer from Georgia Tech within the family. So, well, Jeff. Yeah. Happens to have the same last name. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. well, <laughs> so, Jeff, tell us more about um, you know, uh, your role at Beaumont Products, where, you know, where you saw, you know, the role you played, especially in growing from those five employees to now 125 employees, four sites and, and not shipping piece goods, but shipping pallets. Tell us more. I think um, when I joined Beaumont in 2001, I, I had just come off a consulting gig, uh, a local consulting firm called uh, Kurt Salmon Associates. I joined them out of college and was fortunate enough to be, um, as a young consultant, used and abused and sent around the country. Um, my first stint was back up in the, the Northeast. I guess they knew I was a native and they stuck me up in uh, near, near Newark and uh, reared in New Jersey working in a Macy's furniture depart, uh, distribution center. So that was a, a good time. And then uh, obviously we were doing uh, performance uh, paper performance kind of study is looking at how to make everybody more efficient and, and work harder and get paid for it. Then got shipped out to Northern Idaho, uh, working for Coldwater Creek. So another culture shock there. Um, about 90 miles away from Spokane was the nearest airport. And then uh, after that, got shipped down to LA uh, to go work for uh, Duty Free Stores of America. So coast got to all, coast. Yeah, coast to coast. Um, put a lot of miles on my, my Maxima, so, uh, but had a fantastic time. Learned a lot um, in a short period of time and was able to bring all that back to Beaumont. I, uh, I bowed out of consulting when, uh, when the internet bubble hit in uh, early 2000, 2001, and uh, was offered a gig up in uh, near Buffalo, New York, uh, and then talked to, talked to Hank and said, hey, Dad, um, it's either you or Buffalo. And it was, a, it was a pretty easy sell to come back to Kennesaw and start working for Beaumont. And actually, as a uh, engineer with a whole bunch of logistics experience, we uh, I started off working in uh, in direct marketing to uh, to our consumers and doing mailings. Um, so that was my first taste of marketing, which was interesting. Putting an engineer in marketing, let alone <laughs> an accountant in marketing. So we kind of had a similar path there, um, and then kind of worked all through the the business and regulatory and development, product development, and then eventually uh, my true calling went out to the plant and I started to run the plant. Um, and then eventually came over to, to the corporate side and started learning about more accounting and, and, the, and the marketing and the like. So all of that, um, it's, it's interesting working in a family business as a family member. Um, there's, I think there's two ways to do it. You can either uh, be the family member and just kind of earn that paycheck. The other way is you have to prove to everybody every day that you deserve to be here, not because of what your last name is, but because of how hard you're working and you almost have to work twice as hard as anybody else to prove that um, you are here and belong here. So that was a challenge and uh, it was a welcome challenge. And I, I feel like um, everybody recognized that I, from time to time, I would have people tell me, you know, I don't envy you having to do this. Um, but, you know, we all persevere through whatever we're going through. And uh, eventually, 
you know, got to be in the place where I'm running the company and, you know, so thankful that Hank and, you know, my dad, Hank, you know, it's, it's hard working for your father. So sometimes right. I call him Hank, sometimes it's, he's <laughs> pops, he's my daughter's grandfather. So mm. a whole bunch of stuff going on, but um, so thankful for the opportunity to be here and running the company for him with what he created. Um, and just, just uh, as a second generation family business member, um, kind of shifting the culture from a, a family business to a, a medium-sized company that is shipping those full trucks and pallet quantities to retailers. Perfect. Perfect segue. It's like, you know, you know where we're going next, Jeff. So thank you for that. But real quick, before we get Jason to uh, talk about culture with you both, congratulations on got 30 years in, in a manufacturing family run, now medium-sized business. That is an incredible feat. Hope y'all have a huge party planned. Hopefully we can get out in person and celebrate in person by then, but, but really kidding aside, congratulations. What a, what an outstanding story. All right. So Jason, I'm no, sorry. Mask, no masks allowed. Yes. Right, right. No ma mask free zone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Jason, one of our favorite topics is culture, right? Yeah. Culture, man. I mean, culture, culture is key in everything we do. And I really appreciate you guys both sharing sort of your experience and, and, and having a family run business. And my son helps me here. Um, he had, had been helping. He's, he's still in college. He's in GGC and Lord, he's taking a five-year plan, but he's almost done. May he'll be, he'll be done with that piece. And it has been, it's been fascinating for me to see, the dynamics. I worked with my dad in construction, but that's a different deal because you're out on a job site doing stuff, right? But working in an office environment is a father-son team growing a business. It has been it has been really interesting to see how that worked. And you touched on it a little bit, Jeff, about the 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 expectation of a uh, uh, family member working inside a family business. Uh, but what, what, is, what are some of the other things about the culture at Beaumont that we could take away, that we could, that we could empower some of the other leaders that are on this call with? What do you see that's working? And maybe one thing that you could, uh, you would encourage folks to avoid as, as it relates to culture. Besides working for your father? Yeah, well, yeah other than that. Yeah. <laughs> should, should I leave? Uh, for <laughs> We, uh, can we, can we hit the mute button real quick on this debate? <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I think uh, on culture wise, a eureka moment I had uh, later in life was uh, I'm fortunate to be a member of, uh, of a young president's organization, a YPO, mm -hmm. joined them about 10 years ago. And during my stint there, I went to a talk and heard from the CEO of, I think it was Sports Authority. And he was the first non-family member to be the CEO of that company. And one thing that he said that rang true to me was that um, he, he scrubbed the word family from the business. And he said, you know, he told everybody, um, the reason we're doing this, we're going to call ourselves a team and not a family because family has unconditional love. You can never not be a family member, but a team, you have to earn your spot every day. And we've been trying to instill that here at Beaumont so that everybody understands that you're, you're not going to be here just because you've been here. You have to continue to perform um, every day, every year, prove yourself. So I think that was a huge help. Um, but other than that, I mean, our culture here is um, work hard, play hard. We, we like to, to sell our products. We like to get new distribution. We like to get Citrus Magic up against Glade and, and Clorox and win at retail. And we do that. Um, but at the same time, we like to have fun. We're very casual environment. I'm wearing shorts right now. And uh, that's not just because we're on Zoom. That's my standard outfit every day. My uh, my friend next in the next office over who works with us, he says, you look like you go, go play golf on the drop of a dime. And, and that is uh, true. And I, if anybody wants to play golf, I will go play in, at the drop of a dime. <laughs> but no, I think uh, at, at four o'clock. Only, we, only, only when I'm not here. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> What's that over there? Uh, yeah, four o'clock every Friday, we, uh, we stop work and... Um, go next door and grab some beers from Dry County Brewing, which is two doors down, bring it back to the office and hang out with each other. Mm -hmm. Just kind of unwind the week and uh, see how everybody's doing and check in. So very, uh, very non-bureaucratic office environment. And we have, uh, like to say, we have a lot of fun. That's cool. That's cool. I love that, Jeff. I love that perspective. All right, Hank, I'm going to toss this over to you. I mean, what, how did you, how did you um, uh, form this this culture what was what was your uh, commitment when you launched the organization I mean did you ever imagine going from five to 225 I mean to 125 
Uh, no, not, not, not five to 125. I can, I can tell you that in, in the early days, there was a lot of, a lot of survival. And since, since you and Scott are both, both vets, you'll, you'll understand the, uh, the phrase, uh, last, last one through the chow line. Right. And, um, I, I think that was very much a part of the early days. Um, uh, that's not just the chow line, but it's also that last one through the, through the pay window. Um, many, many a Friday would go by and, uh, my paycheck would sit, uh, in a desk drawer and wait until two or three weeks later until I could cash it because, um, everybody else got, got theirs first. So you, you, you understand the concept of, um, um, last one through the chow line. Uh, and I, I think that was, uh, early, early buying, um, early binding of the of the company the other thing that we did um, early on um, is we hired a number of um, folks from the Tommy Nova Center okay. that uh, had had some disability and I, I think there was a, a uh, to work in uh, the manufacturing um, area um, I think that also helped uh, d develop the culture where people if um, Team, team members, employees, call them what you want, uh, started to care about one another. And I think that was an important piece. Mm -hmm. uh, from a personal standpoint, um, believe very strongly in the golden rule, the, 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 the good golden rule. You know, there are two golden rules in business. One is do, do unto others, which is the, the, the right golden rule. The other golden rule is he who has the gold rules. And uh, <laughs> you, you, you run into that in, 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 in a lot of... Um, um, relationships, uh, business relationships too. But, but I think the golden rule of, tr of treating uh, others as you would like to be treated goes a, a long, long way in any kind of uh, leadership um, situation is um, no, no matter whether you're leading somebody in, um, out, out there on the manufacturing line or uh, leading somebody in the executive team. Um, so I, I, I think that's part of the culture. The other, other thing we did, I think the, the second year that we were in business is we shut the business down on a, a, a given Tuesday or Thursday afternoon, uh, hired a bus and took uh, all the employees down to um, uh, the Braves game mm -hmm. and had a, a, an outing at the Braves game. Of course, the first year we did that, um, I think we, we, we had a couple of station wagons take us down. The last year before the uh, coronavirus, uh, we had two buses take take employees down um and that's a, that's a good time had had by all everybody has a chance to um have have a beer and root root for the braves and um and and, and talk to to one another so good good building um bonding opportunity mm. love that and i love that the, the visual you painted initially it was two station wagons and then last year it was yeah. two buses I love hopefully next year it's two two amtrak trains so we'll, we'll oh, see well, um, this will be our 30th anniversary, so it's going to be a it's going to be a biggie. Nice. That is such a great story and, a, and an outstanding accomplishment. All right, so let's let's go broader. Now that we've kind of gotten uh, appreciate y'all sharing about Beaumont products and and the journey and the growth and and the challenges and the hurdles and the successes, let's 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 go broader. Let, let's um, when you think of the global manufacturing. Uh, industry, global supply chain, global business, you know, this era that we're living in, this historically challenging year of 2020. What's one thing, and Jeff, let's start with you. What's one thing, one trend, news story, development, you name it, that you're tracking more than others here lately? Yeah, it's been um, fascinating um, uh, not to um, be too excited about a pandemic. Um, we were in the right place at the right time uh, when this sprung up and we were fortunate enough to be able to help um, with the fight against the virus. Um, one of our products that we have that we've had for a long time is a, a, a germicidal cleaner. It's hospital grade under our Citrus 2 banner. Um, and early on in January, February, I, I buzzed the, uh, the VP of operations. I said, let's buy up a whole bunch of uh, the active ingredient for that germicidal cleaner because this is not looking good. And uh, we, we bought a little bit, <laughs> but uh, not nearly enough. And um, I think, you know, on a global basis, we were basically playing um, whack-a-mole with outages of different materials. Uh, first, it was 
being put on <clears throat> allocation by the, the active ingredient supplier saying, you know, we can only give you one drum a month where we needed four or five and eventually talked them into three. So uh, worked on that. And then uh, later on, I told all my friends, don't, don't ever throw away a trigger sprayer for the next six months because it's pretty obvious that trigger sprayers were now the next bottleneck um, and then bottles themselves became a bottleneck. I think one of the, not eye-opening, but one of the takeaways, and it, it seemed like every time a newspaper article was getting closer and closer to getting it right, is that a lot of companies that are marketing CPGs don't manufacture their own products. And we were, we we're so fortunate that we have our own supply chain under control because where, you know, some of the bigger players, they're all sharing the same filler and that filler is running 24 seven already before the pandemic, they had no ability to increase their capacity and throughput. So you started seeing outages on shelves of major national brands. Meanwhile, uh, little old Beaumont products here in Kennesaw, Georgia, we had super capacity and we've actually, um, we're up seven times on our volume of, of germicidal cleaner, that one cleaner. And so we were able to go to, to Publix and Walmart and Target and say, hey, we know you can't get this product from this manufacturer, we've got it. And uh, very quickly, we took our medical product out to retail and were able to get uh, retail placement and out to consumers for our germicidal cleaner that is rated to kill uh, the coronavirus. Um, and we got it out there in short, short time and uh, put everybody in line and we're taking orders and, and shipping. And then on top of that, we found another company in, uh, with technology for a hydrogen peroxide based germicidal cleaner disinfectant. And they actually had a partner with capacity to fill. So we uh, quickly launched a disinfectant under the Citrus Magic brand and a natural disinfectant with a hydrogen peroxide. And we're able to get that to market in three months during the pandemic. So um, we you know, rose to the challenge and did what we could to make products to, to satiate the demand out there from the consumer during the, the COVID time. So very Love fortunate. Um, and we've been, I think I have a few more gray hairs than when I started, but uh, we, uh, <laughs> we're uh, trying to meet the demand that's being placed on us. You know, two quick observations there. Number one, uh, the fact that you, your, your supply chain, at least your operations are inside the four walls of, of four sites, but, but inside the four walls, you know, there's a ton of vetting as we've seen in 2020 because counterfeit products, uh, less than authentic products, supplies, we're entering global supply chains. So that's a great business advantage. And then secondly, you know, uh, Hank, you mentioned a couple of big players um, uh, five, 10 minutes ago. I love stories where small companies are outmaneuvering uh, and outperforming um, the large players. I think that's testimony to where, you know, the last few years have been in global business. And, and it's such a great thing because that, that didn't happen 20 or 30 years ago. But here in the era, the information age, where, where so much is at your fingertips, that's one of the great byproducts of, of the age we're living in. So, Hank, uh, what would you add to that? When you, when you look at global business, global manufacturing, you name it, what's one big thing that you're tracking more than others right now? Well, you know, on a, on a day-to-day basis, Jeff is far more in, into it than, than I for all the, uh, all the obvious reasons. But from a, from a global standpoint, uh, clearly um, – the U.S. manufacturing uh, is going to become less and less dependent on China. Uh, that's by by definition. No matter what business you're in, whether you're in, in the drug business or or you're in the uh, product protective um, um, gear business, but I, I do think that's something that you know made in made in China is not going to be. Uh, a, a prideful notice, notice on the back of a uh, label of a package uh, tomorrow as, as it was a year or so ago. Um, the other piece of that global um, business that's near and dear to our heart is the, is the citrus oil business too, um, because of its importance as a, um, as a raw material in one of our products. So that's something we track. But I think the, the other piece, and uh, I'll, uh, um, say say a couple of couple of things historically is the the supply chain going in the other direction has changed so dramatically as to what um, the major retailers are expecting from their vendors today versus what it used to be and um, 
fortunately, Jeff was Jeff was here with the experience he had in the consulting business and and the IT experience out of out of tech that he was a, able to be the point person in making that conversion. Uh, I I had no I hadn't even heard the term EDI, and all of a sudden the whole world is on an EDI system where. Uh, the the orders are coming in electronically. When we started this business, we had two or three ladies sitting out there in the bullpen uh, writing orders, um, uh, taking them over the telephone. And the differences of the impact on that and the, the needs from uh, little old Beaumont products being able to respond and um, react and and play and play their game. Uh, was extremely important in our in our growth, and I, I think Jeff could share a little bit of the fact that uh, he was kind of the poster poster child in Bentonville, and w went down and talked to the folks down in um, in Bentonville about that whole uh, setup and the introduction and how how that system is to be used. So. Jeff, would you like to add anything to that? I think. Um... Last fall, uh, we were fortunate enough to be invited by Walmart to come out to Bentonville to a corporate event for um, Veterans Day. Uh, obviously, Hank being a veteran and us being a veteran-owned small business, and we were recognized as uh, Walmart's Veteran-Owned Supplier of the Year. <clears throat> and during that talk, they were asking me about um, my experience with Walmart, and I told them, you know, I go to every time we have a sales call, I fly out with our head of sales uh, to see Walmart. And it's not because I don't trust our head of sales. It's because I learn a lot by going to Walmart. And, you know, I said it to them and, uh, you know, it, it rings true. If you can get Walmart right, you can get everything right. And uh, by going out there talking to them and, you know, seeing their world-class logistics and how they're working, you can kind of see the, the seams on the fastball and know what's coming next in logistics. And, you know, they've gone to the point now where they're, expecting their shipments to arrive in a one day window. And if you don't hit that one day window, you're gonna be penalized uh, for your whole week's worth of shipment. So learning how to supply Walmart, if you can, like I said, if you can get Walmart right, everybody else is really easy. And uh, I'll do a quick um, call out. If, if there are any Georgia manufacturers that are new to supplying Walmart and need a hand, um, please reach out because if I had had that help, <laughs> 10 years ago and we started with Walmart and had these issues, um, I would have really appreciated it. So I'm happy to, to pay it forward with anybody out there that um, is now supplying Walmart that is having a tough time. I'd be happy to talk to them. Outstanding, uh, big value there. You know, it's, it's been really interesting to watch the e-commerce battles and, and Walmart uh, changing its game and getting more and more competitive to challenging the 800 pound gorilla that's, that's in in that industry and we, we need more competition there. So I, I love to hear what you are doing with Walmart. I love to hear the emphasis they place on working with veteran owned businesses and, and congrats on that honor. What, a, what an incredible honor. Hits keep on coming for the Beaumont products team. All right. So for the sake of time, as much as I hate to do it, uh, we got to start to wind down. Let, let's make sure. So Jeff, you threw a, a great value for our audience out there. Let's make sure folks know how to connect with you and the Beaumont products teams. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, the best way to, to find me is I am on LinkedIn and uh, Jeff Picken on, at LinkedIn and Beaumont products. You just search either of those on LinkedIn, you'll find me uh, pretty quickly. Outstanding. Well, we'll make it even easier. We're going to put those links in the show notes. We're all after this one click, one click. Make mm -hmm. it really easy for the audience. All right, Hank, same question. Well, um, again, uh, Jeff is in a far better position to field those kind of questions than I. My, my uh, information and knowledge is pretty much uh, uh, dated. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, I, I, I think you guys have my email address. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm, I'm on, the, on, the, on the road a lot. I'm um, actually a um, legal resident of uh, Panama City, Florida, and uh, come up here to Kennesaw about one one week a month um, to uh, kind of, um, check in and referee. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I think any anyone who um, you know, wants to reach out and, and talk to someone knowledgeable <laughs> about the uh, supply chain, uh, I think they're better off talking to, to Jeff than they are talking to me, although I'd be I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Awesome. Hank, you don't be surprised if you get a couple inquiries about doing some voiceover work. You've got a, I can hear, I can hear a, uh, Jason, one of your audio books 
uh, narrated by Hank Pickin, can't you? Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> that, that, that's my uh, that's my New York City upbringing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very proper. I love it. All right. <laughs> So let's, uh, as we start to wind down, want to get uh, Laura, you and Jason away in on one thing that you are tracking while we still have Hank and Jeff here. And Laura, let's start with you. You know, as you're sur surveying global business, global manufacturing, what's one thing that you're tracking more than others right now? Uh, tracking what's really going on with the uh, supply chain. Uh, what are the futures looking like right now? Where are uh, companies having to look out to? How far they're having to project out to? So I'm kind of helping from the back side of that, from the financial side, when we talk about budgets and, and uh, customer demand, uh, it's really how quickly are we going to get the product in? We're seeing shortages. We're seeing people at lower levels on inventory than they've had before uh, the past X number of years combined. So that's really kind of where my my time is being spent right now is keeping my eyes and ears open on what's happening with products that are coming in across the country and uh, from internationally into the country right now and how it's impacting companies. Outstanding. Jason, same question. I know your finger's on the pulse across the manufacturing industry. What, what's one thing you're tracking right now? Yeah. I'm going to combine two little pieces because you always like to get one plus a bonus, right? Um, <laughs> technology trends, you know, and as companies have to face what's going on with, with the coronavirus, the way we're engaging with our customers, our employees, our, you know, and our community. Uh, technology trends, man, it is, it is amazing to see how um, businesses are responding and evolving to be able to serve their customers and, and produce the products that they need um, but to tie that back to, to kind of our organization, our foundation is to help support and grow manufacturing in the state of Georgia. Um, we're ready to get back to regular networking. Last year, we did 120 live events all across the state. We toured things from Caterpillar to Coca-Cola to Bluebird Bus to Daniel Defense. And, and, and we, we, we love going in and seeing factories live. Jeff, like you were talking about going into uh, Bentonville to see what's going on out there. Put your eyes on it. You can do some really great things. So that's what we are ready to get back to. Right now, we're, we're filling up our schedule for plant tours and trying to get things teed up for the end of this year and really kicking off 2021. We're expecting that, um, I mean, nobody knows what's going on with the pandemic. If we're, if we're done with it or if we're close, I think, you know, I'm ready to be done. Anybody else ready to be done? I'm, I'm completely ready to be done with the pandemic. Um, but, but we're getting geared up for, because uh, we got to continue to grow. And I think we need to continue to learn from each other and, and, and learning best practices through other connections and being able to do some of these tours. I'm ready to get back to normal networking. Hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. Mask free, like Hank said, you know, we're going <laughs> to soon, soon we'll be able to be in that spot. But, <clears throat> you know, our, our goal is to, to make sure that we continue to serve the manufacturing community and, and the technology. Some of the things that we've done is, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, lessons in leadership series. So Jeff, I may want to pick your brain and have you, have you engage with us a little bit and give us some insights on that. So, um, and, and, that's, that's what I got. And guys, you guys knocked it out of the park. You've done a fantastic job and I really appreciate y'all sharing those best practices. And uh, I know that our, our listeners are going to really appreciate the, the lessons that they learned today. Agreed. And we're just scratching the surface. We know Hank and Jeff, there's so much more to the story. We'll have to have y'all back as we continue to expound on a successful growth story. So, so congrats again on 30 years. Hey, Laura, let's make sure folks know how to connect with you. Absolutely. Well, as uh, Jeff Echo uh, said, um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, just my name, Laura Matajewski under HLB Gross Collins. Um, also on a couple of other social media channels um, or, you know, my email address that Scott will make sure to drop in there. Um, our website is hlbgrosscollins.com. Perfect. And Jason? Cool. I'm everywhere. Uh, uh, <laughs> check out LinkedIn. If you, if you type in the words Georgia Manufacturing in a Google search, you will pop up Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. Uh, GeorgiaManufacturingAlliance.com is a website, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, uh, love to connect with anybody out there for sure. Outstanding. And, and we try to make it just that easy. So big thanks to each of you. We really enjoyed talking with Hank Pickin and Jeff Pickin, both with Beaumont Products. Outstanding story. Thanks so much for joining us. And a big thanks to uh, our co-hosts and the folks that make it possible. Jason Moss with the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance and Laura Matajewski with HLB Gross Collins. On that note to our listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. Um, hey, you can find more about interviews and stories like this at supplychainnow.com. 
hey, uh, same challenge that we challenge ourselves with, that we challenge you with, our audience. Hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.